Today I'm meeting Rick Erson, who's been diving and taking photographs underwater for over 30 years. Are you ready? Whenever you want. Now he's combined these skills and produced something very special. I've got a book coming out, um, which I'm delighted about. It's my first ever book. And so. this isn't a novel. No, it's no. It's a book full of pictures. It's a book with a lot of photographs and also some narrative words that go with it. And tell me what the story of the book is. Right, well, the story is about the hospital ship Britannic, which was sunk in the First World War. And its claim to fame was actually that it was the sister ship of the Titanic. It was actually being built at the time the Titanic sank. And as a result, they put in all sorts of additional um, engineering improvements into it, hopefully to stop it suffering the same fate as Titanic. When you mention the Titanic, of course, mm. you imagine this really luxury liner, yeah. but the Britannic wasn't like that at all. No, it wasn't. The Britannic was built at Harland and Wolfe in Belfast. Uh, and it was launched just before the First World War. But obviously, with the outbreak of the First World War, it wasn't able to be completed. Um, and in fact, what happened was that the British government commandeered it for conversion to a hospital ship. It was white with a red cross on the side. So the, the enemy, so to speak, wouldn't attack it. But obviously, mines are not, um, they can't see, they can't tell, they're completely indiscriminate. And, and so if, if the ship went over it, um, then it went off. And that's precisely what happened. And what year did it sink? Uh, 1916. Okay. Um, and so it, it only had a two year life. It, it did. It, it sounds like it was a very, very big ship. It was, and that, that was part of its problem because it was so big, it couldn't get close in to take on the casualties. So what had to happen was that the casualties went to other smaller ships, which then transferred them to, to Britannic. And it, it had several successful journeys bringing casualties back to the UK. It, it was sailing towards Mudros Island where it was going to pick up casualties, but it was empty of casualties, which was probably the saving grace in, in a way. Okay. In, in terms so did anyone die when it went down? The, the there were some casualties. I think there were 39 people died. It still had a crew of over a thousand. So many, many got off. And in, fa in fact, the 39 who were killed, it's a rather gruesome tale. One of the lifeboats decided to leave before being told they could leave. So they lowered the, the boat into the water and, and set off. Um, but the captain hadn't ordered this. And the reason he'd not ordered it was that the propellers were still turning. And this boat was then sucked into the still turning propellers and chopped into matchwood. Let's think about this diving. Mm -hmm. So you yeah. yeah. obviously know there's big ships down there. Yeah. Yeah. How deep is it? The Britannic is, is, as far as scuba diving goes, is very deep. Um, the, the seabed is almost 120 metres below the surface, way past the range of normal recreational diving, which would normally be to around about 30 metres, maybe 35 metres. Mm. For these deeper dives, we use a thing called a rebreather, which is a computer control system where the gas you breathe in recirculates and it goes through what's known as a scrubber, which removes the carbon dioxide the advantage of this is that you don't need massive cylinders um, to achieve the, the dives. Yeah, I always think of diving as something, whoa, it's claustrophobic, it's mm. dark. I mean, you must be aware of the light darkness. Yeah, it does take quite a while to get down. Mm. The, the ship lies on its side. So the first thing you come to is the upturned side of the ship. Getting down to it, we are using scooters. So we have a little self-propelled device that drags us down. And the advantage of that is it copes with any currents that there are there, which there can be, um, and you can get down much quicker. Describe to me, you're coming down, you mm. know that thing's down there. Yeah, yeah. What's it like when you well, actually yes, see it? Well, it, yes, it, it, is, it, it is 
absolutely awe-inspiring. Obviously, we're diving in the Mediterranean, the water is quite clear. But around about 60 metres down, I could suddenly see the outline of the ship. And it was just this vast area with holes, which were obviously the portholes. And then you looked up, you could see the rectangular bits of the walkways that were along the side of the ship. And how long a period did you have to explore it? We were doing dives of around about 40 minutes on the wreck. And to do the 40 minutes, you then have to take another three hours or a little bit longer before you can actually get out of the water. That's to come up that's, slowly. That's what's known as decompression, because deep depth, you're taking on a lot of this inert gas, which is nitrogen and some helium as well. And you have to eliminate that to a certain level before you can get out of the water. Tell me about any specific things you found or things you were looking for. We weren't allowed to go inside the wreck, but it did allow us to explore the superstructure. So you could sort of go round things and have a look round things. For me, it was finding the bridge gear. So that what, what I mean by the bridge gear is the where the ship's wheel would be and where what's known as the telegraphs, which are, if you can, if you can remember the, the wartime films where they go, ching, 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 ching. And they, full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. <laughs> Both, those things. Yeah. And on, on Britannic, they were vast. They were about so far across. But then also looking at the other structures, seeing the bow with the capstans and the, the chain. Uh, I, I was very pleased with the photograph I've got of the anchor. Um, the, the propellers were were amazing things and the length of diver is the length of the blade of the propeller wow. which is quite something really. And I just want to ask you about living in the Chew Valley. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean is there any reason why this is a good place to be a base for a diver? The, the, the one really good thing about here is is that we're actually equidistant from three quarries that do scuba diving. So there's there's Vobster which is over near Froome as the crow flies, it's only about 11 miles from here, um, but it takes about an hour to get there because the traffic's always terrible. There's um, the National Diving Centre at Chepstow, uh, which also takes about an hour from here on a good day. And there's also Cromhall Quarry, which is up the M5 just past Thornbury, um, which uh, is, uh, is also about an hour from here. So they're, they're all equidistant and, and it's, not a, bad place. it's not a bad place for, for that point of view, yeah. And when yeah. did you get into diving? Because you're not, you're not a young man. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I started diving in um, 1987. Okay. And, uh, just as fun. Just as, just as fun and see, seeing what, whether I enjoyed it. And I did enjoy it. My parents went sailing. And so I did lots and lots of sailing. I was, I was out on the sea all the time. But I, I didn't enjoy sailing quite as much as they did, <laughs> much to their distress. <laughs> so, but I, I did enjoy the diving. And um, so I started in 87 and sort of just did more and more. Was photography a hobby before the diving? I, I'd always enjoyed taking photographs. And strangely, I, I'd... I'd started rebreather diving in sort of about 2005 to 2007 I was involved in helping to film Deep Wreck Mysteries um, which actually spoilt me for video because I was given broadcast quality video cameras in fancy underwater housings and then when I went back to my own it, it, it sort of felt oh, that's a bit rubbish. <laughs> in 2019 Rick used the most up-to-date video and stills cameras to record the team's dives on the Britannic. This was the, the camera I was actually using on the Britannic dives. It's a, a Nikon Z6 and it's equipped with a fisheye um, lens, which you can see is quite a, a bulbous lens on it. Uh, and the advantage of a fisheye 
is that, and if I turn the camera on, you can see it shows quite a wide view. It's almost a 180 degrees. And you're saying the advantage is that you, you want <clears throat> to be up close underwater. You want to be up close because of the murky stuff in the water. The particles. The particles. And even in the clear Mediterranean, there will be murk. And the other thing you've got sitting and the, there, so, the, yes, so that so, camera goes inside, would you mind picking that up? Yeah, this is quite, that's quite heavy, but yeah, on the water, yeah. it's so, not so. The, these are light, these are video oh, wow. lights that, oh, that, that go on it, yeah. like yeah. so, and then what happens is, that comes off. Would water have ever got into the camera? <laughs> this camera's very clever, it has a, if I turn that on it, you'll see it flashes. Mm. That is a leak sensor, uh -huh. uh, and when I turn that on, and put it back together again, um, like so. I then open that, put it back up upright, and I, there's a thing on there that sucks a vacuum into the housing, which then will sense if that vacuum is being lost, uh, and then will flash red at you okay. if, if, if that's the case. It sounds like You've got some images you're very excited <laughs> yes, about. Yes, definitely. And yeah. tell me how excited are you about the book? Well, I'm yeah, I'm very I'm very excited about it. It's um, it's the fir first time I've done anything like that, and because of the Titanic links, there is actually going to be quite a lot of people are interested in this book for that reason, rather than for mm. the the diving as such itself. And can I just ask, is there an age limit to diving? Is there a certain point where you shouldn't take it up? I, I, th I think it, it depends on your own health. Um, and I've, I've been quite lucky and I've kept my health and I'm, I'd like to think I'm reasonably fit. And it's expensive to dive? You can, you can join local clubs, you know, I, I'm, as you can see from the shirt. I've been a long-term <laughs> member of Clifton Subacqua Club and they're always keen to okay. train people and they, they do it through the British Sub Aqua Club, and, it, and it's quite reasonable. Yeah. Lovely. Well, thank, thank you, Rick. And thank we you, look Pete. forward to your next yeah. adventure after this Yes, one. indeed. <laughs> Rick's book, Expedition Britannica, is published on October the 5th. It's available directly from the publisher at this address, or you can order it from Amazon, Waterstones, or your local bookshop.